welcome to Making India a New Deal for Defence. I'm Shireen Bhan. British defence systems manufacturer BE Systems is no stranger to India. The 19 billion pound company has had an over 50 year old relationship with Indian defence, especially Hindustan Aeronautics or HAL. Now, including its previous avatars as British Aircraft Corporation and British Aerospace, it's had a long link with India. One of the top three defence manufacturers in the world, BE Systems has delivered a slew of iconic defence equipment and capabilities to India over the years. Now, in the aerospace segment, it has been responsible for the development of the F-35 Lightning II, the Typhoon, the Tornado. That, of course, is globally, but back in India, it's the Hawk Jet Advanced Trainer or the AGT project, which took off with BAE Systems. Now, it supplied 120 of this aircraft to the Indian Air Force. These aircraft were manufactured at a dedicated assembly line that was set up in collaboration with Hindustan Aeronautics in Bengaluru. And this state-of-the-art training jet has been responsible for training over 600 Indian Air Force pilots and logged about 10,000 flying hours. Now, BAE's contribution to the Indian Navy is nothing to be scoffed at either. Apart from designing, developing and delivering several naval weapon systems, it's also given the Indian Navy several warships and submarines, including the iconic Sea Harrier platform. Now, further cementing its ties with India, BE Systems has won a contract to supply 145 of the M777 light howitzers. It's doing this in a joint venture or a partnership actually with Mahindra Defense. Now, these special howitzers weigh less than four tons apiece, meaning that they can be airlifted to high altitude areas. In this, BAE will collaborate, as I pointed out, with Mahindra Defense Systems and over 40 Indian suppliers will form a part of the global supply chain. BE Systems also is helping India develop its indigenous 1555 mm howitzer, the Dhanush, by transferring intellectual property that's associated with the FH-77 Bofors gun. Well, I caught up with Sir Roger Carr, the chairman of BAE Systems, and he laid out the company's India blueprint for us. Well, I think we're already developing on exactly those lines. I mean, I'm sure you know we've been here for mm. nearly 50 years. Yes. So we've got deep roots. We recently were awarded a, a very good contract for some artillery equipment, which we are going to build in India. So the purpose of the visit, in part, was to see some of our partners, to reinforce the commitment that we have to India, and to look to the future of expanding our footprint here as both a manufacturer as well as a service provider. So what could that expansion mean? Uh, and how soon can we expect the expansion to take place? And what are the potential areas of partnership? Well, we're just building on what we have in part. So with Hindustan Aeronautics, we manufacture the Hawk mm -hmm. aircraft. We are looking to expand the volume of Hawk, and as we do that, of course, that would increase the jobs and the activity here. The new 777 gun that has been ordered will ultimately be made in here. We have a partner established with Mahindra, with Mahindra and therefore we met yesterday to really commit both to a, a very positive way forward to get that product built here as soon as we can. Mm -hmm. The first two are coming over in June and we will see that as the foundation of the build relationship which we will have over the years. So when do you expect that we will see the start of the build relationship specifically oh, I, with your contract with my Oh, I think we'll see that within a year or so and then it will grow over the period. You talked about your partnership with Hindustan Aeronautics for the Hawk. Uh, you know, what is the aspiration there in terms of being able to uh, export the Hawk to, uh, uh, you know, out of India as well? Well, we have a real aspiration to work with Hindustan to do just that. And there is an evolution of the Hawk, um, advanced Hawk, which we think may be attractive internationally. And if we can develop that successfully with our partner, it's a product that could well be marketed in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and I do think you're absolutely right. We do see the foundations here as to supply to India but with the quality of work that we can have done in this country, we think it is also a springboard for export to other parts of the world. So our ambition is to see growth in both of those areas. When we talk about exporting out of India, what is the degree of interest that you've seen, specifically if I were to ask you about the upgraded Hawk? 
Well, I think it's early days to say we have definite interest. There is certainly interest in the aircraft, and its demonstration, when seen, is seen to be a very formidable aircraft indeed. It has to be sold. It has to be marketed. But if we can do that with the very strong base we have here of capability, there is opportunity for the future, and we will be putting our energy into doing that with the Hindustan team. Speaking of expanding in India, the last time you were here, you spoke about how uh, BAE has been able to identify what could be potentially additions to your global supply chain. Uh, Forty manufacturers, apparently, on, on that uh, list. Have you been able to zero down on who could be added on? Well, you're very well briefed, as always. <laughs> uh, but yes, you're right, it's about 40. Um, we've got deep relationships, as you know, with a number of the major companies here, the Mahindra's you've mentioned, but also Tata. Um, and we think we can use that as the first level of work. There's an opportunity, we think, over a period to see the work trickle down into the SME area. Mm -hmm. And, and one thing that we are encouraging is support from government in broadening the offset capability that we take on so that we can have it group-wide rather than focused on one particular aspect of the company and in so doing therefore enable interaction with more of the supply chain in this country on a wider base. Mm. So our, our hope is that we can have a core group of suppliers but use that as the foundation on which to build a much larger range. I'll come to the supply chain in just a second, but since you spoke about the offset obligation, let me ask you that. And we've seen a new defense procurement policy being put in place here in India. Uh, we've seen a change in the defense ministry. The finance minister is now back yes. in the defense ministry, and the defense minister, or the former defense minister, is headed back to, to his home state of Goa. Uh, do you feel more confident about the regulatory environment in India post the changes that have been made? Well, I think our confidence is, is, is based on really the momentum that we see in India as a whole. I mean, we've seen under Prime Minister Modi huge change in the attitude to expanding with international partners. Some of the barriers coming down, some still to come down, some to be broadened and opened. But the general mindset, I think, of India in positions of authority is to reach out and enable international activity to take place more easily. And I think it is a growing confidence that we see in India that encourages us to invest here on a further and further basis. You know, FDI now 100% allowed for the defense sector, and at the heart of the defense policy is design and developing in India. How does that work for you? Oh, well, I think it works well. I mean, we've, we've got a history of, of being willing and able to transfer technology. It isn't simply asking India to make things and assemble things. It is to develop things with us. And that, I think, given the quality of people we now see in India, is something that we embrace very positively wherever we can. So are we likely to see you ink more joint ventures in India? I mean, we've seen a, a few maybe not even a handful actually, mm -hmm. a few companies now look at joint ventures in India. Boeing has just done one recently with the Tatas. Are you looking at the possibility of joint ventures in India? Uh, we certainly are. I mean, as we build up the volumes, then it is in partnership with, with mainstream Indian companies who have high quality people, they have real ambition, they have skills, and I think more than anything, they have appetite to work in true partnership. And people who have all of those aspirations and abilities, plus the set of ethics that we see in a lot of the companies we now deal with, we can work with those companies on a long-term basis. What do you see as the big challenge? I mean, you're talking about what's good and what works for you here in India, but what do you see as the big challenges, if any? Well, I think the foundation stones are all in. Um, and I think what we're talking about then is just speeding up process a little, making sure that you know these things can move forward quickly once they're put forward as an opportunity. I think some of the paperwork could be eased. I think some of the terms and conditions of mm. trade uh, could be simplified to be more international in style. You know, these are the, the points of detail, but they do frustrate the pace of activity. My Anything own, in specific? Well, I think the terms and conditions is one thing that certainly could be tidied up, really, and put on an international footing. And it, it is a point of detail, but nevertheless, I think everybody understands that the easier the paperwork trail, the faster we can process documentation, the quicker deals get done, and the sooner we can get into business. 
Since we're talking about uh, business and trade, let me ask you about a broader question on two-way trade between India and the UK. The Brexit is now, uh, well, inevitable since yes. Article 50 has been triggered uh, by Theresa May. Uh, what is the, the larger impact that you see as far as trade between India and the UK is concerned? Because some would see this as, as being a potential uh, sort of building block, so to speak, for the two countries to take uh, the relation forward. Well, I think it certainly is. I think, it's, um, I think there's no doubt you've seen in the number of visits that the country's having. Our Prime Minister was over, Philip Hammond, the Chancellor, was over yesterday, as you know. I think this is all clearly demonstrating the level of engagement we want to have with India. It, it is a very important part of the future trading of our country. It, it, it happens that your ambition as a country to grow mm actually marries at a time we, we as a country have decided to change our course and therefore the global relationships, our ability to build bilateral relationships post-Brexit, I think will strengthen all these opportunities. We have to work hard to demonstrate our commitment and follow through but I think in India we have willing partner and if we have a willing partner I think you'll find us to be very committed to the process. Well, in terms of UK investments into India, one of the key concerns was the, was the retrospective tax uh, uh, issue which has plagued companies like Kane and Vodafone. Is, does that continue to be uh, on the list of priorities or concerns when UK uh, businesses are looking to invest in India? It, it's not a concern that we've experienced. I know others have found difficulty in that area. I'm sure just as the UK want to open up markets here, India wants to ensure that it gets good partnerships from the UK and all of the issues of the past I'm sure can be addressed and I'm sure will be addressed given the absolute commitment and the enthusiasm mm. of your leadership here mm. which is creating great momentum and huge change. What's your own outlook as far as the UK is concerned? Uh, uh, you know, you wanted to stay uh, w within, and, and, and the vote was very different. Uh, but how do you see that impacting the economy, at least as far as the transition period is concerned? Yeah, I, I, w I was very much on record as a Remainer. I felt being part of Europe was a good thing. Um, I'm also a business pragmatist, and that is not going to happen. So I think the mission for government now is to make sure that it, ne it negotiates the most favourable business terms possible, because it was 44% of our export market. I think, however, what it does is stimulate business to recognise that if in the long term we are to succeed, we have to put more and more energy into the markets that were not necessarily European and secure, into markets where we have friendships, history and opportunity. And we should reinforce our effort in that area over this period of negotiation where we are still part of Europe mm -hmm. but headed for the exit door to use that time effectively to strengthen the relationships elsewhere. Mm -hmm. It requires hard work, endeavour, all the things that we all have to do to be successful. But I think British business, whether it wanted to leave or not, is focused now on making a success of the position we have. And that's why we're all here, of course. In terms of operational challenges, I mean, you know, things like passporting rights, etc., have been on the list of concerns that businesses have expressed. But beyond that, what do you see as being the big challenges from an operational point of view as we go through with this process? As far as Europe is concerned? As far as UK is concerned. Well, as far as the UK is concerned, I mean, it has a whole series of hurdles to cross. If you're in the financial community, passporting clearly is one. I think what we see as reasonable people is that there is value on both sides, the UK and Europe, in maintaining the closest relationship possible. Clearly, it will not be on the terms that as were members, mm -hmm. but it can still be attractive terms to both parties. You know, it is, an, it is a trade between two parts of the world that needs to be maintained. So I think we have to work hard as a government team to win in a positive and constructive way terms that work for both. I think as a business community we have to keep working hard with Europe because they'll remain a key customer but look increasingly outside Europe to build a more balanced and a more stable long-term future. Since you're talking about looking outside of Europe and 
you know, you talked about India as being one of the key markets that at least specifically BAE is going to be focusing on. You just met with, uh, with uh, the Defence Minister, who also happens to be the Finance Minister in Parliament. Uh, you know, in terms of strategic partnerships, because that's the one policy detail that is still awaited, was there any clarity that he gave you on, on that or uh, what, what could be expected? No, we, we went to emphasize our own credentials, really, as people with deep roots in the country and a big ambition to develop a bigger position here, which I think we were able to do. We left behind some of the, the, the requests that we have to ease some of the processes of trade, little points like the terms and conditions and the offset capability, which there was a definite willingness to engage with. I, I think what you have in all senior positions here are people who understand we are at a moment in time both Britain and India and if we work very positively together at this time it will benefit both of us so we left I think having had a positive meeting and pleased to have had the time on what was a very busy day today <laughs> so let me end then by asking you what could be the headline for BAE in India as we start this new financial year oh I think a long history a great future and a commitment to the country. Do you want to put a number to that? I never put numbers <laughs> to anything, but the commitment in principle is strong and we will work hard to make it the biggest number possible. It's time now for us to slip into a short break, but when we return, we speak to the chairman of Hindustan Aeronautics. The company is gearing to fly into the Lal Street and also developing a fifth generation fighter jet. Of course, has close links with BAE systems. That and more when we return. <laughs>